Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you happen to be watching this. I hope you're having a great day. We're beginning the mini deaths of Layla Starr. We're working with the connection paper and we're dealing with chapter one or issue one, Once Upon a Falling Star. As always for the YouTube bots, all the borrowed images and quoted text are used for educational purposes. These videos are designed to help students who miss class catch up. I'm not trying to make any money. This is not a monetized thing. This is an educational endeavor. Let's begin with the idea of the comic. I, I talked in the assignment video about the differences between a graphic novel and a collected edition, but let's just talk about comics at their base form. First thing should always be, what are they? And I'm going to give you a simple definition, sequential art. This comes from Will Eisner, one of the uh, writers of the 40s and 50s who produced some great books, uh, groundbreaking work. However, I think we can go a little deeper. Scott McCloud comes up with this idea of that comics are juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information and or produce an aesthetic response in the viewer. In other words, we're going to be looking at pictures. There's going to be some words. We are going to convey a story. And with that story, we are probably going to go a level or two deeper. And in the meantime, we should have some sort of aesthetic response to the art of the story and the art of the pictorial slash other images. As McLeod says, this is not something that usually comes up in casual conversation, but for our purposes, we're going to be looking at this idea of the art to produce an aesthetic response and convey a story. I think I also need to point out that comic books are a unique art form. They have angles and point of views, the way a movie director has to shoot a scene in a movie. The artist will have color palettes and different ways of composing and contrasting the colors on the page and the characters in relationship to the background colors. That's the way the painter does it. And just contrasting things all the way through. And I think if you look over to the side, there's two ways to kind of view it. A lot of people talk about the idea of it being a novel without a, with pictures. That's entirely possible. However, it also could be that it is film without sound. That it goes much, much deeper than words first, art second. It might well be that it is the art with the words and the subtitles just no sound. And I haven't figured out the answer to that. We might talk about it in class a little bit. And maybe I should just give you a quiz and make you answer it. On the page, I'm not going to have you get the idea of the panel or the frame or the speech bubble or the gutter. Again, there's no quiz here. I will, however, be using the term panel ever so often. I w may well talk about the gutter outside. I may well talk about going outside the frame. All of those things may get mentioned. So if you just take a quick look, you've got the idea of what the panel is. It's one picture on the page. You've got the idea of the frame. It's the white border around. And you've got the idea of the gutter, the in the uh, element that goes around the page, the white element that goes around the page. If you take a look at the comic, step one is just enjoy reading. Ram V is not treating this seriously. One might even accuse him of being a bit irreverent. So you have these little silly things happening. You have Brahma asking death about hobbies and friendships. 
when death probably doesn't have a whole bunch of friends. And you have the, well, have you been here for an eternity? Well, obviously death has been here for an eternity. And you just kind of have the awkward situation between two you know, gods with one of them getting ready to fire the other one. And then you have just a cheap joke told well um, about, you know, death having, having her corner, or excuse me, taxes having her corner office, all of that. And you have a way for us to know that we're talking about Kali, the Hindu mother goddess of creation and destruction and time and death, because they're never named. Brahma, we have to guess at, but Kali identifies herself as she is screaming and shouting about, you know, death losing her job, taxes still having a corner office. Enjoy reading, enjoy the silly jokes, and remember that we're going to talk about something a little bit more serious as we go through here. One of the things that we possibly might talk about, that you possibly might want to write about, is the idea of fate versus free will. Einstein's famous quotation about, did God have any choice in the creation of the world? And if you look at the bottom of the uh, little clip that I have from the New York Times article, the question was just his way of asking whether the universe could be any other way than it appears to be. And if not, how much room remains in that universe for things like chance, for things like miracles? Fate versus free will. Brahma seems to be tied to fate in at least two ways. Number one, the scripture, the prophecy, for lack of a better will, better word, excuse me, seems to be totally and completely determining his actions. It's in the file. It has to happen. Also, there seems to be a bit of fate in the fact that it goes all the way up. Corporate isn't going to let them change fate. Vishnu isn't going to let them change fate. The idea that Brahma, who used to be one of the main gods, and now just a little research tells me he is worshipped in only two or three temples in India, he has no control. He was the creator, but Vishnu and everybody else has seemed to take over, and all of them are bound by fate. Instead of turtles all the way down, it's fate all the way up. Fate versus free will, continuing here a little bit, because again, I think those of you who come from a Calvinist background, the idea of predestination and foreknowledge might be a, something that you are familiar with. And again, I'm willing to bet that someplace along the line, philosophers and theologians that you've encountered in your classes We'll talk about the idea of fate and free will. Darius seems tied to fate. The twelfth day of the twelfth month shall he be born, the child who shall bring eternal life. Fate. No choice about it. However, Layla Starr the one whose body death inhabits. Her path was forged by her own will, aided on occasion by the kindness of strangers, but it was forged by her own will. There doesn't seem to be a lot of fate there if it's forged by her own will. So are only the gods ruled by fate? Are only certain individuals ruled by fate? Or does free will come into play and the gods choose to ignore it? I, it's a question that it is open in this book. And as we go through the end, we'll see how fate and free will play out, how Darius reacts to fate and free will. And I think, again, the theologians, the philosophers that you read in your other classes, all of them, I think might have something to say about fate and free will, and it might make a decent paper. 
Next, linking of life and death. If you take a look at this, I think we need to look at it in three or four ways. First of all, we have somebody who is later going to be identified as the God of life, taking a lot of time looking at death. And I think it just becomes a simple question at the character level. Is there a romance between life and death as characters? And I think it's always important to try to treat every piece of literature that you deal with, including a comic book, where you are peeling an apple to get to the core. So if these characters are in love, is there some symbolic element that has us thinking about the fact that we who are alive spend a lot of time looking at death, wondering about it, hoping to avoid it, trying to understand it. The second thing I think we need to do here is take a look at, there's perks to being the God of life. He brings her back from the death, from death. And we see right here that there was, he's not going to spend the whole time doing it. There's going to be times when he's going on living, having a cup of tea, enjoying his existence. You'll notice also that the name is Prana. And from what little research I've done in the Hindu deities, Prana is the life breath of the universe. And there's the idea that there are vital breaths that a living organism cannot live without. So once again, I think there's probably plenty of stuff in theology in particular about God breathing life into Adam, about the breath of life coming from God that you might be able to take a look at and see if Prana's actions here are reminiscent of anything that you've come across in your theology class, in your religion classes, BLI or whatever. So please think about peeling the apple. Perhaps it's just the characters. Awesome. Perhaps it's a symbolic act of looking at life or of life looking at death. Or perhaps there's some discussion of time. How much time do we spend contemplating our lives? How much time do we spend wondering about, worrying about, attempting to escape death. In other words, watching death. And how much time do we perhaps take advantage of the perks of being alive? And how much time do we think about life and breath and God's breath in us, however we want to look at that situation? Peel it away like an apple. Try to get to the core. The book, I think, also takes a look at a contrast between mortals and gods, mortals in our view of time, mortals in our view of eternity. At the beginning, certainly the idea of gods being eternal, death being eternal, are there. All right. Brahma's been there for an eternity. Death has been there for an eternity. The gods have eternity on their side. On the other hand, Prana tells death, tells Layla Star, we have, humans have one lifetime. Each of us have one lifetime. And what we do with it is between, well, birth and death, that's kind of one way of looking at the speech bubble there. But also, the idea of what we do with it is between us and God, or us and you know our own conscience, or however you want to take a look at it. But there, what we do with it is in some ways up to us, which again goes back to that free will concept that seemed to that Brahma seemed to ignore, that Prama seems to uh, Prana seems to point to here, and the idea that time may stand still or seem to stand still for the gods because of eternity. However, for Layla Star and for Prana, the god of life, we find out that, or for Darius, excuse me, we find out that 
Darius is eight years old now as we move into part two. Layla Starr, you know, died twice eight years ago. Time has moved on. Life has moved on. And I think it's important to just think about when we talk about the many deaths of Layla Starr, we're also talking about perhaps some symbolic deaths for humans as well. The idea of a baby being innocent, everybody kind of accepts that. But we also start running into sort of the death of innocence, the ages of accountability. And seven or eight starts becoming the time when people start dealing with um, that sort of situation. You know, the philosophers and theologians, I think, start arguing about when is that moment of accountability. And eight years old might be the time when that happens. So book two, we're going to take a look, perhaps, at the death of innocence. I'm going to move away from theology a little bit into something I'm a little more comfortable with, myth. And one of the things I think it's important to deal with is the idea that when one hears the term myth, one usually thinks about the idea that it is false, that it is completely and totally fabricated, that it is made up. And I think it's that definition is completely and totally wrong. I think that the best way to look at myth, especially in the traditional sense, is that we are dealing with stories that express truths without letting facts get in the way. From C.S. Lewis, the myth became fact. There are three or four, three things I want to take care of, and then I'm going to go back to playing theologian without a license. First, Lewis talks about to be truly Christian. And let me remind you that Lewis was perhaps the key apologist of the 20th century, the one of the key Christian thinkers of the 20th century. To be truly Christian, we must assent to historical fact and also receive the myth. And if you look at the last sentence, the one is hardly more necessary than the other. Believe Christ as fact. Believe the myth of the God who came down, became mortal for the good of all humanity. That's a myth that crosses a lot of cultures. They have a God who became mortal. The other thing I think that's important is that Lewis, to back up what I said earlier about myths being important, some men have derived more spiritual sustenance from myths they did not believe than the religion they professed. Myths provide truth. Myths provide sustenance without letting facts get in the way. As a transition, I'm going to keep going from the bottom up. Balder and Osiris were gods who died for the good of men to some degree. And with that connection of the dying God and Christ, Lewis goes on to talk about incarnation for a second. Incarnation transcends myth. And the heart of Christianity is a myth, the incarnation, and also a fact. We have a sort of incarnation in the many deaths of Layla Starr. We have an inversion of that as well. And so I think it's important to understand that inversion is a connection. Instead of a God to bring life, we have death. Instead of being born and going through life in a traditional slash normal slash usual way, we have death inhabiting a body that has already died and that body coming back to life. There is an incarnation of a sort there. And certainly 
your BLI classes and your theology classes will have plenty to say about the idea of incarnation. I think it's one of the points here where I want to talk about art being important. You'll notice the sort of surreal background on the panel. You'll notice that Layla Starr's body goes outside of the page, that it's outside of the frame, it's outside of the gutter. It is going from the natural limits of the page into something totally and completely unlimited, totally and completely unnatural. I think it's important to look at art that way in situations like this. And you've got this idea of the body who's been created for her. You've got the idea of arriving on the mortal plane in that body. You've got an incarnation of some sort. Again, this is a spot that it can work. But I want you to understand that Ram V believed he was dealing with these stories as myth, not as religion. And so it's important to understand that, again, I'll repeat, myths are stories that are true without letting facts get in the way. Or reveal truths without letting facts get in the way. So this inversion of life and death and coming down into a body at birth versus a body at death, all of those things might be ways to discuss things that were in your religion classes. Just moving on to work cited, the how to read a comic book, C.S. Lewis, Scott McCloud, and did God have a choice, uh, Dennis Overby. If you have any questions, please ask when you get back to class. I hope this has been somewhat helpful to give you some ideas of what to think about. Please, please, please remember that you have to use uh, quotations from two sections, two issues of The Many Deaths of Layla Starr, and two quotations from works that you discuss in the other classes as we go. And again, I hope this gave you some ideas of what to work with as we go through the um, getting ready to write the paper. Hope all of you have a good day. Hope to see all of you in class the next class period.